So this first question is, what does it take to make family engagement programs really work? And who better to help us figure this out than the new fellows who are from our education sector, the three principals and leaders of districts that we've just announced. So they are going to come on board um, with Yuling Cheng, who was running the, as director of the Parents as Allies program you'll hear about in a moment. And our moderator for this is Heather Riemann, who is the director of advocacy for America Forward, and which is connected to New Profit and has been doing some incredible work over many years on what it looks like to, to support whole learners, including families, in kind of this next uh, transformative phase of education. So I am going to say welcome to Heather, who is going to come come in now to moderate this panel, and then we'll have this conversation, and we'll then we're going to take a short break, and then we'll shift to the assessment conversation next. And Heather, there you are. Okay, right. welcome. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for having me here. I actually used to work here about 15 years ago, so it is thrilling to be back. And it's also great to be in a room with so many people who are thinking deeply about education. And I've already had so many different conversations, people coming from different perspectives, and it's just been wonderful, rich conversation. And I'm really excited for this panel we have because we're gonna get to dig into one of my favorite topics, which is parent engagement. And uh, when they asked me to do this panel, I was thrilled because for three reasons. One, parent engagement is such an important topic. I think we all intuitively know it's critical in schools, but research really backs that up. But the question of how to do it and how to do it well is really a hard one. And I think that's often why it's overlooked because people are like, ah, just don't know how to do this well. And I will say I'm also a parent of 12-year-old uh, twins. And I went to back to school night last night, which, ooh, four hours wandering the hall of fluorescent lighting with no food and drinks, mostly with PowerPoint slides that said the same thing. Oof, not the best example of parent engagement. So I don't know about you, but I really, I know what it, what it means and feels like to have really good parent engagement. And I also know what it feels like when you don't have good parent engagement. So I'm excited for this panel today because we have some real experts on the ground who are doing this hard work of figuring out how to do it well. Uh, so uh, first off, we have uh, Tabitha Marina, assistant to the superintendent in the Newcastle Area School District, and Erica Slavodnik, principal of K-8 schools in Duquesne School District. Um, I'm going to skip over one sec because we're doing practitioners first. Scott Miller, who's the principal of the Avonworth Primary Center of the Avonworth School District. And then we're also joined by Yuling Cheng, who is the director of Kidsburg, an online research, a, re a resource on children's learning, health, and play, and also runs a really innovative family engagement project called Parents as Allies, which we are going to have the pleasure of learning more about today. Um, so with that, let's, let's kind of just dig in. And I wanted to start off with um, sort of thinking about how you define family engagement, because I think people can kind of define it and think about it in different ways. So I'm curious from our uh, on the ground practitioners how they think about family engagement in their school. So we'll start with you. Um, at our school district, we know it's a partnership. It's a collaboration where the parents, the guardians, the school, we all work together for the students. Working together for the students, we give them their best educational um, experience, but it's good for their overall well-being. What we really focus on in our school district is those partnerships, that collaboration doesn't thrive unless the foundation's a relationship. So we take the time with our parents and guardians to build a relationship on trust. We have to trust each other to work together. Build a relationship with communication. Um, if we don't have open two-way communication where we're sharing and we're listening to understand each other, um, those relationships cannot be built, uh, built solid. And then hopefully we get to that shared decision-making where the parents are working right alongside us. 
once we focus on building that relationship with our parents, we see that those that collaboration, those partnerships, they thrive to benefit our students. So we focus on the relationship building first and then start working together for the students. Yeah, that's such a key piece and definitely was a little bit lacking last night, but <laughs> uh, Erica. Um, I think just always thinking about like what our parents and families like need and how we can like assist them. Um, you know, we want our families to know that we're working as a team um, with, you know, for their child and how can we work as a team? How can we collaborate um, and bring, you know, all these different things kind of like together on what they need. So just kind of like listening. It's not like a one way conversation where the school is telling them like, this is what we're doing and that's it. Like just seeing what their viewpoints are from like the families and stuff and just like welcoming them in and seeing what we can do to assist them. Great, and Scott, love to hear about it in your school district. So being a K-2 principal, we fo I focus on welcoming and belonging because I'm the first, for some families, I'm the first one on this K-12 to journey. So we have to get it right from the start. So my work and my staff work really starts almost a year ahead before kindergarten, uh, child even enters kindergarten. So I think, you know, creating those positive environments, welcoming environments, and really, like everyone said about having parents as partners, um, but really thinking about like the first day of kindergarten, it starts even before that, and it's really this marriage that we have um, as a first uh, experience in the K-12 to educational program. Terrific. Turning to you, Yu Ying, I would love to hear more about the Parents as Allies program. I know in Pennsylvania, you have teams working together and you're doing some really innovative things. I would love to hear more about it and also a little bit how it's different than sort of traditional family engagement programs. Thank you. So Parents as Allies started in 2021 and it's a family school engagement project. We have 31 school teams from 28 school districts that participate in this. And so here, I'm gonna try to summarize three years of work in three minutes. But it started with research, right? So it started with the Brookings Institution and they had just launched a report called Collaborating to Transform and Improve Education Systems. It was the family school engagement book, playbook. 30,000 data points of which Southwestern PA contributed 2,000 data points. So we had data to start with. We, we knew what teachers and parents were saying about the purpose of education. We knew what the perceptions were between parents and teachers, parents and caregivers and teachers. Um, we understood a little bit about some of the barriers that people were seeing, right? We all see the benefits of family school engagement. We know absenteeism goes down, learning outcomes improve, parents are more involved. But you know, why isn't this work being done more widely? So we talked about the barriers, that some parents had a negative experience with school and that plays into then how they serve as a parent for their child in school, right? You can also think about that schools aren't generally set up for family school engagement. I needed to go visit a teacher the other day. I have to make an appointment. I have to sign in at the outer door. I have to sign in at the inner door. Safety is important, but it does prohibit some aspects of family school engagement. So we started with the research, and then we went through a human-centered design process. So schools understood the research, they signed up to be a part of it, but the most important part was they had a team. And the team had to be co-led by a school person, whether it's an educator, a social worker, a superintendent, a principal, right, and a parent. They had equal say, equal power. So we were trying to balance that power and balance that you sometimes see. Um, and the teams were made up of at least uh, four parents, and then the rest were maybe a classroom teacher, a paraprofessional, the librarian, someone who was involved with kids. So these teams went through a pretty interesting process, deep listening. Um, they talked about the purpose of school. Uh, they conducted empathy interviews where they interviewed their community. They came back and mapped out their community assets. Um, and throughout it, we had fun. They mapped up storyboards and so forth, and we sent out visual capture artists to capture what they were learning. And then the third part that I think makes it interesting is they developed hacks. And we purposely call it hacks, not solutions. 
right? So these teams of parents and educators were working together. And if you give people too much time, I find that sometimes they start to overthink it. So go out there, try a hack, and learn. See what you learn from it, right? What we just learned from Sesame Street. Go experiment, learn, reiterate. And so they created hacks, mini hacks, big hacks, and more hacks. In the meantime, we were working with experts who kind of guided us in like some ideas of how we could improve. Ooh, I love this idea of hacks, and I'm very curious for your schools what the hacks were. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about what your the teams came up with. Scott, why don't we start with you? Sure. Our hack at the primary center was, uh, you know, we were focused, like I said, on welcoming and belonging. And if you get your little stat sheet from the Department of Education, it looked like we didn't have a lot of diversity. We were at 90 percent white. Um, and that was an area of focus for us as a school community. When we went through this process and with the parent co-lead, we realized we have a lot of diversity in our district, a lot of cultural diversity, a lot of uh, celebrations that are that are um, that are held that you know, we wanted to explore as a community. So we started in our primary center uh, and just had a very intentional setup where we celebrated uh, Lunar New Year, Day of the Dead, uh, and Passover. And we looked at those three sort of celebrations that were part of our community, and we had parents and their families help co-present those uh, to the greater population. Um, that hack led us down a two-year path of now we have students in our secondary campus that are being the creators of these events and we we've turned them high high neighbor so you know seeing who's actually here in our community and being able to learn from them directly I do want to add you have food at your events <laughs> that was one thing we learned about barriers is making sure we have food but that was an important part of the process to increase attendance and participation um, you know as others added transportation and different things so that was part of the process excellent Erica I'd love to hear about your hack so our hack was um, the Duke Showcase, um, and we did the Duke Showcase because a lot of our parents and families wanted to see what were their students doing like in our school building. Um, so we wanted to make it like student-centered um, and complete event around our students and what was happening like in our school. So we had all of the students um, and their teachers basically were able to showcase their work. So it wasn't the teachers that were saying, yes, we did this in the class, we did this. It was the students that were talking about what they were learning about, what they were doing, their hands on things. We also had resources. Um, so families could also get any resources and things that they needed. Um, we also had careers there um, where we they could actually have an interview for a job like right there and see who was hiring. It was all like in one, you know, one stop. Um, you know, we had food, we had a cookout. And it was a really nice day, like for our first one. We had like bounce houses and stuff for the kids, different activities, music and stuff like that. And it just brought the community together and the families in a fun way. Um, you know, they got to have informal conversations with their teachers because all the teachers were there. Um, the kids had a lot of fun. Um, you know, now we're starting to grow on it. We just had our second one, um, and then, you know, we're kind of doing it each year and kind of like expanding on what we did the previous years. Awesome, that sounds so fun, and my kids would have loved that. <laughs> um, and Tabitha, what, what did your team come up with? So one of our hacks that we did was, off of our empathy interviews, we found that we had a larger population of families that were new to our community, new to our district, new to our town, and um, they didn't know how to get involved. Um, they didn't feel comfortable not knowing faces of um, people to come to the school. So our hack was, okay, if you're not gonna to come to the school, we're gonna to come to you. You're part of our family. We wanna meet your families, you're gonna meet our families. So what we did was we invited every district employee, whether you worked in the cafeteria, whether you worked as a paraprofessional, a teacher, an administrator, we said, grab your families. We rented out a movie theater in town. Everybody likes a movie, family fun night. And we invited these families. Um, I didn't mention that many of these new families either didn't speak English or English was their second language. So that was a barrier for us 
um, automatically. So we said, how are we going to do this? We're going to do family fun night. We set up a family photo booth when they came in. They got candy, popcorn, all the food, and their movie ticket, their family photo. And we wanted them to meet us, meet our faces, see our faces, see our families, and we wanted to meet them. So maybe they'd be more comfortable coming into the school building. We work with the movie theater to contact Universal, and we rented out every theater or every yeah theater in there, and we had the movie playing in English with Spanish subtitles, so everybody was comfortable to come and watch the movie together. So we started with just scratching the surface with building those relationships, letting them know we'll come to you. Our doors are open at the school. These are the faces at the school. These are your teachers. These are your principals. These are our families. You're now part of our family coming to our school. So coming to them and um, meeting them was a wonderful night, and we've seen a lot of participation um, after that. So it's one of our little wins that we saw, one of our uncommon measures that we saw coming from it that we learned in Parents as Allies. And I know you all are doing a sort of really thinking about family engagement and sort of redesigning it and keeping in mind sort of the needs of different stakeholders. So I'd love to hear in this sort of redesign process, what have, has been sort of an eye-opening moment or something new or surprising that you've learned or sort of a different perspective you, you saw from? Um, I don't know, Scott, we'll start with you. Sure. I think the the biggest uh, gain that I've had professionally and personally is really having that parent co-lead. So, you know, having an equal voice like you, an equal power, um, like you said, uh, really just to myself get out of the way and let the parent take charge. And, um, you know, for so many years, you know, I planned reading night. I'm an elementary principal, and but it was very, uh, it was very one directional. And I think this process and this journey has really allowed me to see from a leadership perspective the importance of two directions from planning to reflection, that whole process. Um, but that is really my big takeaway from it. Um, I think our the eye-opening experience was that parents know like what they want if you ask them. Um, you know, when you don't ask them, then you're kind of like, you know, one way, one way thinking. Um, and if you collaborate with like the families and the parents to see what they want, then that will bring in the more community and the more family into the school. I think um, our empathy interviews were eye-opening. Um, we still practice those today. Where we run those throughout the year. Um, we ran them at the end of last year. What are we doing that you like? What are we doing that we can improve? What are some ideas? And. Um, so often in education and probably in many other um, facets of work, we move quickly. And we were throwing up ideas and we were throwing out events and activities and then saying, well, nobody's coming. They don't want to come. They don't want to help us. We have to do it ourselves. And that was closing our doors. And these empathy interviews told us the why. We stopped, we slowed down, and there was a why. We had a group of parents that um, had a negative uh, perceived perception of their own schooling. We had groups of parents that were new to the community. Slowing down and taking the time to listen to the parents and understand the why um, was eye-opening because that opened our doors back up um, to work together. And I'll just add for empathy interviews to give you context. If you were a parent or a caregiver, you had to conduct an empathy interview with the school person, whether, again, it was the teacher or someone else who worked at the school. And then vice versa, if you were the school educator, you had to reach out to parents and conduct the empathy interview. But what was interesting is the group came up with the questions together, of things that they were curious about. And then they came back and downloaded and learned from each other. And it kind of was the springboard to hacks. I love that sort of two-way communication and two-way interviewing. I feel like so often it feels like it's just one directional. So I really like the idea of that. And I, I can implement that in our school too. Um, I know we're getting a, a little shorter on time. So wanted to sort of think about the audiences out there and uh, who is uh, having, you know, th maybe thinking about family engagement in their schools or in their lives or how to implement it well. And I'm curious from your perspective, what is sort of, not, not super long, but what is sort of some thoughts you have on engaging in sustainable, impactful family engagement that you could sort of leave people with if you were going to sort of give people a, a tip on that? 
Um, a tip I would say, it's not a one hit wonder. You don't throw up an open house and you're done. It has to be the norm um, going through your school district. It has to be the culture of all of your teachers, all of your employees working with you and making it a priority to work together mm. and take the time to do it because it's worth it. Yeah, it's time consuming too. I and mean, that is one of the things I've really learned that you have to put in the time to do it well. Yeah. Um, I think just being a good listener to what your families and what like what the parents need and um, being open to new ideas that maybe that you didn't see before um, and welcoming like those ideas and you know try and basically you know trying trying them out but always listening to what they need um, and how you can support them. I think from the building level really is just to, it's okay to release control and let the parent, you know, we are, are co-partners in this, but really like make the parents dreams that are on the committee become reality. And that, that was a flip, but I would really encourage that and going through in the future, again, empowering more parents to take the lead and say, no, this is what we want for our community. Or this is what kind of maybe event or process we want. And then, you know, I work behind the scenes as the red tape to make sure, you know, release red tape and make sure everything that they want happens. And I'll just add from my perspective where I've seen a lot of these teams do their work, I've heard two things over and over. One is you can only move at the speed of trust, right? So you have to focus on building that trust and however fast it wants to move is how fast you can move in that project. Um, the other thing I heard a lot about was uncommon measures. So as a group, we do measure our impact. We do collect data and we try to... Um, put it together in this guidebook where you can see the journey, what the lessons are learned. All 31 school teams contributed to this guidebook and shared what they learned, what their hack was, and what they might do differently next time. But what we've talked about a lot as a group, and we collaborate and exchange ideas all the time, is uncommon measures are important. I know the common ones are important too, the number of people who showed up, how many students you're impacting, so forth. But the uncommon measures of, hey, I finally connected with this parent who I've been trying to reach, right? And now I have a relationship and now I understand why. And we've connected over what their child's dream is in school. And it may just be one little interaction, but that interaction speaks volumes. So um, we also try to collect the uncommon measures throughout the project. Yeah. That dream piece is really big. I, uh, one of my kids are in elementary school. We I got an email that the teacher would like to come visit us in our home. And so they showed up at our door. And then they asked, what's your dream for your kids? And it was, I was not expecting that as the question. And it was really interesting to have that conversation with them at the beginning of the year. And it also just established a relationship with them and a sort of level of conversation that I that was really welcome and, and new and innovative. And they, they did it for a couple years in a row and it was a really uh, impactful approach. To, and I know, I think we have time, for, I know we're running a little short time, but I think we have time for one question. And I saw a burning question here in the front, so. Oh, okay. I just wanted to acknowledge how wonderful the people up there are. When we use the word hack, we mean shortcut. The stuff that you did took hours and hours and tons of people's involvement to make it happen. And I applaud you for that. They weren't hacks. They were mini festivals. <laughs> you, you did amazing things. Awesome. Do we have time for? Yeah, I think we've got actually a good five minutes or so. There's a good question. And a few will come in online, too. OK, oh, wonderful. wonderful. Hi, so can you um, speak, I know this work is still fairly new, but these are great um, things to hear about. And can you speak to the benefits you reap from the time you're putting in, the relationships you're building, how you're able to connect now? What are you seeing happen as a result of that increased family engagement? 
So one of the things that we're seeing, um, we also work um, with the Grable Foundation through AASA, and we are piggybacking our ideas right now. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're trying to get our parents and guardians into the classroom, small groups, not just the large group events. So coming into those small groups and working with academics with students. So what we're doing right now is we're allowing our teachers to work with a parent and come up with a, a mini grant, a mini hack in their classroom. And they're writing those mini grants um, to my office and then we are helping them bring those to life. And one of the things we're seeing is our classrooms are packed not only for pizza or snacks, but they're packed during academic time too. And the teachers are being able to connect on a small group level with the parents and get to know them a little bit better. I just put out for this school year, I was telling you, Ling, um, the application to teachers, and in the first week, I got 10 applications already. Um, we ran over 60 of them last year. We started that last year. So not only is it the large group, but we're getting involvement and engagement in the small group that might be a little bit intimidating for people sometimes, but it's happening and they're being um, tied to academics. I'll just add one benefit I've seen from another school district. I, I love all 31 of these school teams, but I know one school district had a little bit of money left and so they created postcards. They gave a set to teachers that were pre-addressed to the students that they could send home to the parents. And so if something happened in the classroom, they sent it home that day. But what was interesting is they also sent home a set of postcards to the students that were pre-addressed back to the school. So the parents could write something and send it back to the teacher. Immediately at first the teacher felt it was a lot of work to write 30 some postcards, right? But the first postcard they received from their um, parent, they got so excited because it was something like, my child learned this and showed it to me today and I just wanted you to know that you're making an impact. But the principal made a third set of postcards and sent them to all the teachers at the end of the school year, thanking them for the time they spent on family school engagement. Mm. So what is the impact this year? Everyone's asking, where's my postcard? Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, <yeah. laughs> Hi, so you've kind of answered the question that I had. I know teachers are really resistant to new things, new programs, new ideas. So I was gonna ask, how was the teacher's attitude with this, these new hacks? that you have for the school system. But you've kind of answered that question anyway. Yeah, so I think it uh, was really organic. And I think, you know, also with what we are hack, success spread like more success and new ideas. So before one event even finished, we had people coming up to our committee and saying like, when's the next, when's the next one? We wanna add Morocco, we wanna add this, we wanna add that. So, um, you know, at first I think teachers were, like you said, they were like, what is this? Is this another night or is this whatever? Um, but now we have um, teachers that are on the planning for each of the countries, each of the celebrations. Um, they're bringing their spouses to the events. So it's really becoming, um, you know, much more than just uh, something on the calendar. You know, it's now becoming a community focus and everyone's really excited about participating from all their different perspectives. Can I go because I have a microphone? <laughs> Um, I have two questions. One is, are you all documenting any of this in sort of newsletters? Is there, on top of the very hard human work that you're doing, are you then sort of documenting and evidencing and then sending that back so the broader community can see? And what is the feedback on that been? Because there's kind of two camps here, right? Like parents sometimes feel like they get too much stuff from school and they don't quite know what to do with it. On the other hand, is have you found that there are effective ways to be communicating around what you're doing here and with other things that are working? And then also just, and this is a question about the postcard exercise. You know, a lot of classroom apps try to do this. And I'm curious if you think the postcard thing is um, maybe in its analog beauty. Um, more effective than say a class dojo where you're sending home, you know, this is what your kids were doing today, feedback to us. Thank you. Um, I know like with Duquesne, we do a lot of social media um, and we try to like tell our story because if we don't tell it, somebody else will. Um, so we always try to showcase everything that's going on like in our school. Um, like when we did our Duke, you know, Duke showcase, like I, I'm a picture person and I take out I take so many pictures and everything and 
just putting that out on social media, um, blast and things like that. We do have a monthly newsletter too, um, you know, where we write the story and everything like that. And it's been a positive thing like for our community, um, even for our community members who maybe don't have a child in, currently in school, um, just to see like what the school district is doing. So it has been a positive thing. And I'll say for the cohort, we've documented every step of the way with pictures, videography, every template we've ever created with human design experts. We, we make it available on our website because we don't believe that we should be the only ones that have this. We want to share it, and we want you to help us improve it. Um, at kidsburg.org, we've written an article on every single school team and their journey from literally what they determined as their North Star, their goal, to what their hacks were. Um, and we also worked with Learning Heroes and 100, who have also documented our work and shared some global lessons from it, along with Brookings Institution. All right, last question. <laughs> yes, thank you. I wanted to be sure to get um, some of our good questions from online. This is from our colleague, Zahava Statler. She asked, what kind of budget allocations or designated staffing is needed to pull off this sort of deep, deep and collaborative family engagement? I mean, the grant funding we had was generous. Like, we'll work with whatever is given. So, you know, our, I think we had three, you know, different rounds of 3000 anywhere to $10,000 based on, you know, the, where we were with the grant and the process. And I think what I uh, did as, as the building leader was really kind of threw that out to the staff. So we got creative with things. So, you know, maybe we couldn't um, pay everyone a stipend, but we could buy a nice Moe's dinner for everyone that helped stay and set up. And I think, you know, some of those things were equally as important to the staff so we were able to bond with the parents that were involved um, and, and we're using money resources that way at least from my perspective and I'll add during the human centered design sprint because of the funding we received from the Grable Foundation um, we did pay honorariums to all the members that participated parents teachers super you know whoever it was because we did not want there to be a barrier for any parent to not be able to participate. So we respected their time and the value of their time. And with that, I believe we were hearing from parents that you normally don't hear from and they started to participate. Um, so that was, it, funding is important, but what I will say is all three schools here and other schools, they're starting to do more things without any funding. And it's just great to see schools allocating funding towards family school engagement. And you'd be amazed the community support, support too, when you reach out to the community, like the movie theater, um, the help that they give you too, because they believe it's important. It strengthens our whole community. All right. Well, I, I don't know about you all, but I am super impressed. And I just wish that all schools and all children could have this type of parent and family engagement. I mean, think of the transformation that would bring. So thank you so, so much for the hard work that you're doing, for all you've shared with us today and what you do in your schools all the time. <laughs>